How many times have you heard a student say, in the middle of perhaps struggling through some math homework or something, say, why do I have to really learn this? Why do I have to learn this math? You can imagine, what are the answers typically? If it's not that you're going to need it to be successful in your life, in your career, managing your personal finances, it's, well, this is something you're going to need for college. At some point, you're going to be studying something more interesting, and you're going to need the math for it. The thing I'm really trying to point out here is I think there's much more to math than just that. You know, I'm always hoping that somehow it's worth everyone's while to be here in this lecture tonight, and some of you are going to be part of this workshop that I'm giving for the next couple of days. Um, but I'm really hoping sort of my small goal would be to walk away with one thing, one new idea that you can walk away with and say, oh, that was worthwhile. I'm glad I came because this new idea I can now carry with me. Uh, and, and if there's a bigger goal, it's to, to help you or perhaps start you on a new way of thinking about math altogether. That would be a very ambitious goal. I'd have to say, and I was pointing towards this a moment ago, with this need for math to be practical, I think in our society today, the purpose of math really, we're led to believe it's, it's something of a language or a skill that you'd use later. The implication is, we're told, that math in and of itself isn't meaningful. It, it achieves, we achieve meaning through learning from mathematics by studying something else. And I disagree with that. How young can you be to take an AP course now? Um, freshmen, so ninth graders are taking AP courses now. Used to be only for seniors. And it's kind of crept down slowly over the years. And so we see these people who are graduating, these students who are graduating from high school, and they've had maybe a dozen AP courses. So what does this really mean? So they're in high school, and they've had all of these college-level advanced, there's, the whole idea of an AP course is it's college-level. It was originally supposed to give you college credit, and a lot of colleges are now calling this into question. So it's part of this race to get ahead, and what ends up happening is they'll go off to college, and I've, I've seen stories of this before, and I can think of a student I was talking to who went to college, had done, the a, had done AP um, calculus, went to college, and they determined she wasn't ready for calculus two, right? because that was the idea. Oh, I took Calc one as an AP course. Now I'm doing Calc, I should be ready for Calc two. Wasn't ready for that, struggled with that, went into, then was placed down to Calc one, and then determined that she wasn't, actually didn't have the skills for that because her pre-calculus wasn't strong enough. So got put into a pre-calculus course and was really struggling with that, right? And so I think these are the things that I think in terms of Waldorf education that, that I think this can be a strength of ours. If we do it right, you know, we can give a solid foundation so that they can really be ready to do the right thing at the developmentally appropriate time. And I think that's something that we're really striving for here. It's kind of a strange math quiz, to be honest, because it really encapsulates a variety of grades, but I just, I'm going to make a little bit of a point out of some of this now. And is it clear what the question is here? Of course, this is the classic joke, right? Find x, and then somebody points an arrow to it and says, here it is. No, that's not, that's not the intention here. But what is it, what's the real question here? To find x, given that these two things are said to be similar. Okay, these two triangles are said to be similar meaning, similar meaning, same shape, the angles are all the same. And so we want to find x here. You may not remember this. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to give you a chance to do this. I was working with this second grade class, having a lot of fun with them, coming in every day. And, um, and I'd, I'd come in and I'd do some mental math. And so my goal was to sort of build up over the period of a couple of weeks where they could do something like 62 minus 59, right? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a tough problem for a lot of second graders, 62 minus 59, right? And so we were practicing it in all sorts of ways. That would be like sort of the culmination. We'd do, you know, 5 plus 3, 3 plus 5. 30 plus 50, 50 plus 30, you know, that's how it would start, and then it would slowly get harder. And at the end, I'd always cul culminate, we'd do mental math for maybe 10 minutes or something, 
um, because second grade's a really good time to do a lot of mental math, I think. Um, and then it would culminate with me giving some sort of puzzle. And so I gave a puzzle to them that particular day, and it was a, it was a particularly good puzzle, it seemed, because they were so into it. And, it was, and that's what I love about second graders. They're so enthusiastic. It's lovely. Um, and they were so into this puzzle, and they kind of, at the end of it, I said, okay, I have to go. And, oh, please, Mr. York, don't, don't go, because I want you to... I want to tell you what I think the answer is. You can tell me if it's right or something. And I said, okay, fine. I guess we don't have to go yet. And so it was kind of time for their snack break. And so I sat down in the chair in the back of the room and they formed a line. And one at a time they came up and told me what they thought the answer was. And inevitably, one after the other, I said, no, but it's close. And then they'd get to the end of the line and come up with another <laughs> guess. And some of them would be in line multiple times like this. And um, it was really neat. And I think one... One child ended up getting it um, before, before I walked out of the door. And the rest of them, it just went into, you know, they just went out at the end of school wondering it still. And maybe some of them forgot about it. But this one boy, Jimmy, did not forget about it. And his mother told me a couple days later that um, they had gone after school. They went out when they were doing errands. And Jimmy had to go get his hair cut. And he's sitting there and he's telling the barber about this puzzle problem, right? <laughs> while he's getting his hair cut, and then at some point later, they're doing their errands, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the grocery store, he, he becomes very ecstatic because he finally solved the puzzle. He's very happy with himself. And his mother told me the story. It was really neat. And so the question is, what was the puzzle? What puzzle would be that engaging for second graders? Yeah? And the answer is, it was this. And that's not that fascinating of a problem, is it really? So what made it so interesting? Because it was actually just a mental math problem. And in particular, and that's my point, I wouldn't do it like this in second grade. Right? Because this invites itself to be doing what? I mean, I can't even honestly, I can't even remember how to do this exactly. Yeah. Kind of looks like this, doesn't it? Yeah. I actually don't do that in my mind. So I sometimes forget how it's, yeah, it's taught, right? But I think I did that right, yeah, right? And that's what made it such an amazing problem was that they hadn't learned, they hadn't learned how to do borrowing or carrying or any of that. They certainly knew place value, right? And so I just said that orally to them. What's, what's 4,000 minus 222? I did write it up on the board, right, so they could see it. And I didn't write it like this. I wrote it horizontally, so it looked like this had a little star up in the right part of the, the board there. And I said, and that, I did that every day. I'd come in and give a new problem. And then first thing the next day, I'd come back and say, hey, who got the, who got the star problem today or last night? Who was able to do that? And then we'd go over it. Yeah. But that was a big challenge, wasn't it? That's a challenging problem. One could argue that was a little bit insane. Why am I doing that with second graders? Right? But my point is simply this. The problem a lot with mathematics is that many of these problems all of these problems, in fact, become something of a mechanical procedure. And that, if I'm really going to, and that's what I talk about every time I give a lecture anywhere, and I'm sure I said that the last time I was here, that if, for us, if that's what mathematics becomes, if it becomes just, me just mechanical procedures, especially without understanding the math behind why it works, that that becomes, that's no longer math. It's no longer math. And in fact, I would go as far to say, for much of our world today, mathematics, for many people, mathematics is a collection of what I call blind procedures. A blind procedure is a mechanical procedure without any understanding. And for many people, math, unfortunately, is a list of blind procedures that people are just applying to meaningless problems. And so as teachers, what we really want to be able to do, how we can teach math better, is to find ways to bring math so that it's not just a blind procedure, so that there's understanding behind what we're doing, so that it's, it's an adventure, it's discovery, and it's struggle. Because struggle is good, and that seems radical in today's world, doesn't it? Because as parents and educators in this world today, it seems like more so than it had been in the past. Am I, maybe I'm wrong. 
but it seems more than ever today we don't want our children to struggle. We want things to be easy. Right? You see these, these textbooks out there, right? Making math easy, making this easy, making everything easy. And that's not the point of math. We don't want to just make it easy. We want there to be struggle. And yes, we want our students to work through that struggle. That's important as well. I used to coach skiing. Right? And I remember specifically with my daughter um, having this sense of, OK, and for her, as it is for, you know, and it's true in athletics as well, and many, is what's the next level you're trying to get to, right? What's the next challenge you're trying to, you know, be able to rise to? And if we can, I, I like this analogy that, okay, you're taking your student out on the ski slopes and you want to give, you want to bring them to the next slope that they're able to accomplish. Right, the next level of challenge. And it's going to be hard, and it's going to be a struggle, but you know as the coach that they can do it. And so I can think of this one time with my daughter. She was probably, I don't know, eight years old or something like that. And we came to this next slope, and she looked down, and she's like, I can't do that. No way, no way. And the whole time down, she was like, oh, I can't do this. It was so hard. And she was, you know, not happy at all. Finally got to the bottom of it. She looked up. And she was so thrilled. And what was her first reaction? I want to do it again. And there was so much pride. And so that is the art of teaching, to know what problems can I give where I know it's going to be a struggle, but I can see how it's going to go. And I can, because yes, we want our students to struggle, but we also want them to work through the struggle and feel success. If they never feel success, that's not good either, obviously. But what I'm pointing out is also not good if they never if we don't value the struggle. Because in our society, you hear it all the time, you know, my student struggles, my child struggles. Right? And what I'm fond of saying is, well, there's the opportunity for the greatest success possible. Because if you can work through that struggle, imagine that. That would be wonderful. Here's my short list for the higher purpose teaching math. Math teaches us how to think. Now, I don't mean in a rigid way, like this is the only way to think, but it's a training in thinking in so many different ways. An analytical, a creative kind of thinking, problem solving, all of this. It also, math teaches us how to struggle. This is going to seem strange, but I like it. Math combats cynicism. What would you mean by that? I think we live in a cynical world today, and that's kind of what I was talking about earlier in the lecture, that people can come to think that math is meaningless. There's no point to it. Right? Why do I have to learn this stuff? But if we can teach math in the right way, it can open the children up to a world that's filled with beauty and awe. And that's what I mean by combating cynicism. And I think Waldorf education, in many ways, does that. If we can really have the students experience the world of, uh, to, to experience that the world is filled with awe and wonder and beauty in all the different subjects that they study, I think we're doing a great service to our students right there. So that they're not leaving high school thinking that the world is a terrible place and meaningless and they become cynical. Rudolf Steiner talks about the spiritual and moral development. This may not be something that you would talk a lot about outside of Waldorf circles, but maybe you could. And Rudolf Steiner talks about how math is an essential part of, the st of young children to really develop their own thinking and relationship in the world that's, that's moral. And then later in life, that this enables the possibility of further spiritual development. Math teaches us what it means to be human. We can think of Waldorf education in many ways and 
Um, I'm sure you've all had that experience of trying to explain Waldorf education to friends or family in a short amount of time. We can talk about it as a developmentally based education. We can talk about it as an education that develops the whole human being, all these different things. But I really like this idea that math is really human-centered. It's really teaching students what it really means to be human. And it's one of those things. Of course, all of our subjects do this, but math is an important one as well. Because it's really through thinking, and this thinking in a very different and unique way that human beings are capable of, that really separates us and makes us human. This is before I actually came to teach at a Waldorf school. I had just come to Boulder. I hadn't had that fateful bus ride yet. And I was tutoring a girl who was um, in, she was in the local public school. Her father was the owner and founder of a computer hardware company in Boulder. And I had many interesting philosophical conversations with him. His name was Roger. And one day, um, I asked Roger, I said, Roger, what is it that you really look for when you are hiring somebody new for your company? I mean, here's a computer company. I could just, I was curious what he would say to that. But his answer surprised me to the point that I still remember it today, some 30 years later, 25 years later. He said, well, if I'm looking for a computer programmer or somebody, and there are all kinds of positions that we have that I just, any number of people could fulfill that. He says, I don't worry about that. But if I'm looking for somebody who's really going to be, somebody who's really going to be able to carry my company and really, uh, especially in today's world that's so competitive, so that I can really do, we can really do something that's going to be cutting edge. Somebody who's really going to make a difference. He said, I need to make sure, yeah, they need to know computers, but I'm also looking to make sure that they're an artist. I thought that was really interesting, an artist. Right? And he meant it literally. He meant it, he wanted to see something on their resume where it said hobbies or something like that. There was something artistic there. And that stuck with me for a long time because I think there is something there that for our Waldorf students, if they're really going to be able to go out into the world and be able to think, be able to be top engineers and scientists, <coughs> to have that ability to be an artist as well allows for the possibility, I think, of a different kind of creative thinking that may not exist otherwise. And that's where I think our Waldorf students really have, uh, really have a leg up on other students.